Hey, I'm Jesse. Let's have a devotion. Isaiah chapter 19 is particularly beautiful. Egypt, arguably one of the two most powerful nations in the world at the time. Egypt and Assyria. Egypt was the former enslavers of the Hebrew people and was militarily uh, incredibly powerful. It was geographically, like strategically located. And Assyria was seen as indomitable. And then right between them is this little tiny country. It's, you know, it's now divided, Judah and Israel. And this passage is going to foretell of a day where free travel, even among the Assyrians and the Egyptians, was possible because there's going to be the worship of God in all of them. Remember when God made his chosen nation Israel, it was on a covenant with Abraham so that all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Now, the way that things go with Egypt thereafter, you wouldn't think it's going to go that well. Right? The Egyptians actually enslave God's chosen nation. Fast forward through uh, the Exodus and then the founding of, of Israel on God's promised allocation and then the um, and then through the the period of the judges and then the monarchical era of Israel now into the divided kingdom. Uh, Egypt is still this encroaching enemy and this daunting specter. They've got Egypt to the south of them and then they've got uh, then they're surrounded on all their sides. I mean, we've seen God speak about some of the other nations nearby, like Moab and 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 um, even the town of Damascus and, and then Assyria. Uh, and it looks like they're surrounded all, on all sides by enemies, but God is able to call people to salvation from absolutely anywhere. The Egyptians worshipped the sun. This was part of the reason for the plague of darkness and in the the freeing of the of the israelites from their slavery uh their their slavery to to the egyptians their name for the sun god was horus or ra and they had a whole city that was dedicated to the worship of their their sun god this passage is going to describe even people worshiping god in that city and then when we're done i'll tell you what's even cooler uh about how this prophecy has in very recent history also manifest fulfillment. Here's Isaiah chapter 19, a pronouncement concerning Egypt. Look, the Lord rides out on a swift cloud and is coming to Egypt. Egypt's idols will tremble before him and Egypt will lose heart. I will provoke Egyptians against Egyptians. Each will fight against his brother and each against his friend, city against city, kingdom against kingdom. Egypt's spirit will be disturbed within it and I will frustrate its plans. Then they will inquire of idols, ghosts, and spiritists. I will hand over Egypt to harsh masters and a strong king will rule it. This is the declaration of the Lord God of armies. It's, uh, it's remarkable to use the language of, a, of, of harsh masters over Egypt because they were once the harsh masters over the Israelites. Every time one nation enslaves another, it ends up in the long run with a lower gross domestic product than the nation it enslaved. There's only one exception, and that is the U.S. The only nation in the history of the world that's ever fought a civil war to end slavery. Here's verse 5. The water of the sea will dry up, and the river will be parched and dry. The channels will stink. They will dwindle, and Egypt's canals will be parched. Reed and rush will wilt. The reeds by the Nile, the mouth of the river, and all the cultivated areas of the Nile will wither, blow away, and vanish. Uh, the Nile flows to the north. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong in, in the comments. Is it one of the only rivers in the world that does this? Uh, it flows north, and I think it empties out into the Mediterranean Sea. And all of Egypt is dependent upon the water of the Nile. That's their, their source of fresh water. And so this prophecy describing their channels stinking, right? Because these dry, these drying uh, riverbeds give rise to, you know, they become stagnant water and, and soil, and then they give rise to the growth of bacteria, you know, and, and, and peat moss and things like that. I don't know if that's indigenous to that area, but it smells bad because their only source of fresh water is drying up. 
the reeds by the Nile, the mouths of the river, and the cultivated areas of the Nile will wither and blow away and vanish. They set up these sophisticated irrigation systems, draw upon the rivers of the, uh, the, the water of the Nile River to irrigate crops. But when that goes away, those crops all die and they wither. Then the fishermen will mourn, and those who cast hooks in the Nile will lament, and those who spread nets on the water will give up. Those who work with flax will be dismayed. Okay, you'll make a lot of, uh, you can make clothing and all sorts of all sorts of things out of out of flax. It's an excellent uh, sort of tactile substance. The uh, those combining it and weaving linen will turn pale. Egypt's weavers will be dejected, and her wage earners will be demoralized. When the when the Nile dries dries up and the irrigation systems fail, and they can no longer grow flax, and they can no longer create these products. The princes of Zone are complete fools. Pharaoh's wisest advisors give stupid advice. I'm not embellishing. That's the word. That's the text of verse 11. That's Isaiah 19:11 in the CSB. How can you say to Pharaoh, I am one of the wise, a student of Eastern kings? Where then are your wise men? Let them tell you and reveal what the Lord of armies has planned against Egypt. The princes of Zone have been fools. The princes of Memphis, okay, not Tennessee, the original one. The princes of Memphis are deceived. Her tribal chieftains had led, have led Egypt astray. The Lord has mixed within her a spirit of confusion. The leaders have made Egypt stagger in all she does, as a drunkard staggers in his vomit. No head or tail, palm or reed, just speaking to the totality um, of, of, what, of the effect that God's going to have, like from the head to the tail to the palm to the reed, like from, uh, from top to bottom, left to right, no one will be able to do anything. Um, well, we'll be able to do anything in, uh, for Egypt. So there's this proclaimed time of calamity coming upon Egypt, and they won't know how to make sense of it because the advisors are all stupid. The princes of Zone are complete fools. Pharaoh's wisest advisors give stupid advice. How can you say to Pharaoh, I am one of the wise, a student of the Eastern Kings. Where are your wise men? Let them tell you and reveal what the Lord of armies has planned against Egypt. They're, they're, all of their plans fail because all of their counsel comes from something other than the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and fools despise wisdom and discipline. They have useless degrees. They are well learned in pagan thought and they are, they, their, their philosophies are influenced by, by nihilism and by paganism. They've been worshiping the sun rather than the one who created the sun. They enslaved the Israelites. And was it Seti II who bore firsthand witness to some of the most incredible miracles described in the Bible? And now they've gone back, you know, to the, to the worship of these, these pagan gods. However, God's not done. When we have a knowledge base that is something other than God, it's ultimately going to fail. Our advice is ultimately going to be stupid because it is, it is, it is flawed a priori. If it's knowledge that comes from something other than a fear of the Lord, it's knowledge that comes from, for example, in the case of nihilism, literally nothing, nothingness. All right, from atheism, it's a worldview that cannot account for the origins of dirt much less life, much less morality, much less a reason to come to the table and have the conversation at all. There's no working definition, no axiom with any authority that can delineate evil from good at all. And so it's a priori messed up. If it comes from a pagan faith system, it comes from something that the enemy manufactured so a priori, it's all messed up. They may have these moments when they speak the truth, but in those moments, it's because they're borrowing from God. This is, this is the state of things morally, ethically, philosophically, and now even in terms of government strategy in Egypt. Pharaoh is surrounded by people who give stupid advice, and they can't reconcile what's happening to them with the plans that they've made because God is the one who's sabotaging them but he's not done. Look at verse 16. On that day, Egypt will be like women and will tremble with fear because of the threatening hand of the Lord armies when he raises it against them. Right? So this was verse 16, politically very incorrect. All right. If you want to email Isaiah 
and complain about his sexist remark, his email address is Isaiah at I'm in heaven and I don't care what you think dot com. He's referring to their army as a bunch of women who are scared of an army full of men. I know that that's not politically correct, but it's what Isaiah said. And it's also what would happen. Verse 17, the land of Judah will terrify Egypt whenever Judah is mentioned. Uh, whenever Judah, Judah is mentioned, Egypt will tremble because of what the Lord of armies has planned against it. That's, that would have been shocking to hear. People would have heard that with incredulity because Egypt was so prominent and powerful and Judah seemed smaller and weaker. On that day, five cities in the land of Egypt will speak the language of Canaan and swear loyalty to the Lord of armies. One of the cities will be called the city of the sun. So here's where worship of Horus or Ra was centered. And evidently there are going to be people there who worship the Lord. On that day, there will be an altar to the Lord in the center of the land of Egypt and a pillar to the Lord near her border. It will be a sign and a witness to the Lord of armies in the land of Egypt. When they cry out to the Lord because of their oppressors, he will send them a savior and leader and he will rescue them. The Lord will make himself known to Egypt and Egypt will know the Lord on that day. They will offer sacrifices and offerings. They will make vows to the Lord and fulfill them. The Lord will strike Egypt, striking and healing. Then they will turn to the Lord and he will be receptive to their prayers and heal them. On that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. Assyria will go to Egypt and Egypt to Assyria and Egypt will worship with Assyria. So now there's free trade and travel between these enemy nations and Israel sort of like the, the, this little go-between. And there's worship that's pervasive across the land of Egypt and now evidently in Assyria too. On that day, Israel will form a, a uh, triple alliance with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing within the land. The Lord of armies will bless them saying, Egypt, my people, Assyria, my handiwork, and Israel, my inheritance are blessed. This is a phenomenal prophecy. And it's one that is coming true today. Um, <clears throat> I've spoken before about how, you know, uh, I have trouble always getting along with cops, uh, but I, I really like cops. Add a T on the end and capitalize it. These are Coptic Christians. Something remarkable happened about the time that I'd started seminary. Reports came to our missionaries uh, across Cairo, uh, from our missionaries across Cairo, that Muslim men were walking up to them and saying, I've seen a vision of you, or I've seen a vision of Jesus, and I know that you are the one who can tell me how to become a Christian. Incredibly hard, you know, to, to go to a Muslim context uh, as an American and then lead people to Christ, right? Like my wife has, my wife has done it. It's incredibly difficult. Uh, and so what a lot of missions efforts focus on really is trying to equip local, uh, local indigenous peoples to then equip others for, for evangelism. But this was something we could not have prepared for because it was something the Lord was just doing, giving dreams and visions to Muslim men to go approach our missionaries, perhaps sitting at a bistro table at a cafe and say like, lead me to Christ. All right. It's like, a guy going out and fishing for marlin and then one of them just like jumps into the boat. Like I wasn't prepared for this. And it was happening multiple times in multiple instances, all independent from one another. The only people who first picked up on the pattern were the missions agencies at home, like the International Mission Board's headquarters were like, uh, we're getting the same call <laughs> from different parts of Egypt. Uh, over the course of time, you know, the, the, the growth of Christianity in Egypt has been, has led to this Coptic Christianity. It's a fascinating discussion on the contextualization of the gospel, because you'll have these guys who sort of almost verge on the practice of syncretism. They confess that Jesus is Lord. That's critical. But at what point do they begin to integrate pagan beliefs and formulate a totally different religion? It was some of these same Coptic Christians actually who came under uh, uh, came under attack 
um, not so long ago. But there is a presence of Christianity in Egypt today. And it was prophesied that Egypt and even Assyria would become homes for the worship of the Lord and that Israel would almost would serve as this highway between them, connecting them and informing what, it, what the Bible calls a triple alliance. On that day, Israel will form a triple alliance with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing within the land. And here's what God, God will say. Remember what he's spoken about Assyria and remember how he's disciplined Egypt, even earlier in this chapter confounding them because of their stupid advisors. But look at how it ends. The Lord of armies will bless them, saying, Egypt, my people, Assyria, my handiwork, and Israel, my inheritance are blessed. That's refreshing, right? I mean, because these devotions have gotten difficult. You know, it's just like a pronouncement against Moab, a pronouncement against Assyria, a pronouncement against Damascus, a pronouncement against my own people, Judah, right? And then there's this prophesied union, this reconciliation with God's people at the center and the two major powerhouse military forces of the day reconciling because they're united by the worship of the Lord. There's, a, there's an altar at the center of Egypt. There's even worship in a city that is named for the worship of the sun god and gods in it. It's not a new thing to ask for God to move mightily among his people and to bring his mercy down rather than his wrath. We at the Redemption Church refer to this as revival. That's what we mean when we say revival. Because here in Seattle, there's never been anything quite like that. San Francisco and Seattle are the only two major U.S. cities that have never experienced anything quite like a true revival. And we're asking that God does that because when he does, it will be notable. It'll be the kind of thing that people are flocking to, like, what is happening in Seattle? It's because the Spirit of God would move and draw people from darkness to light, from sin to repentance. And we find ourselves positioned perfectly for exactly that. This passage is more audacious than our prayer for revival in Seattle. This passage describing Egypt and Assyria freely traveling and sharing in common the worship of the Lord. This passage that refers to Egypt, the former enslavers of Israel, as my people, that's in verse 25, and Assyria as my handiwork. These are nations that God had just proclaimed judgments upon and that he did visit upon them. But look at, look at what else there is. This passage is describing something that is beyond the wildest dreams of diplomats anywhere. This is something that the UN would laugh at. The idea that, the idea that uh, especially in this context, in this era, at this time, that Assyria and Egypt would be united with Israel in their worship of the Lord. This is, the, if you were to say like, hey, I've got a vision from God and China and Russia are going to join the US and there's going to be mass revival and free trade among us. People say, like, you have a serious grandiosity complex. But that's sort of a modern equivalent to what's described in this passage. And it's what God said he would do. So suddenly our prayers for revival in Seattle, just one city <laughs> in the U.S. where Christianity is legal, you know, and is the, you know, the founding influential moral compass for our Constitution, uh, it... It's not so far-fetched at all. It's not that crazy at all. It's far few, fewer people being saved. It's politically already facilitated, all right? It's, it's not even, it doesn't even require a treaty between two nations, much less three, as was the case for this audacious, beautiful prophecy of Isaiah 19. So suddenly asking for God to show mercy on a lost area like this one seems well within his capacity and wheelhouse to do because the scope of this reconciliation and revival among three nations is beyond anything we could possibly imagine today. God has done greater things in the past. We're asking him to do this today.